You're listening to the Real Estate Runway Podcast, powered by Quattro Capital, where we are all about alternative business and investment strategies to help you amplify life and maximize wealth. Here's your host, the recovering engineer turned multifamily investor, Chad Sutton. All right, Real Estate Runway family. Today, we've got a good friend of mine, Percy Nicara from Penn Capital. This is a fantastic operational group. I encourage you to listen to this episode. We're going to just be bantering back and forth some knowledge of our investment thesis in the multifamily industry, focusing more on that of Penn Capital. We'll talk about how they're using a fund to store dry powder and get ready for some deals that are coming through the pipeline and just to give them more buying power. But fantastic groups, can't say enough good things about them. Before we get into the episode, if you get any value out of the show, leave us that five-star review, like us on YouTube, subscribe. All those ratings are worth their weight in gold, and it helps us pay it forward and get to more people just like you. So pay it forward, friend. I appreciate you in that regard. And if you're looking to be on the show, hit us at thequattroway.com slash podcast. We'd love to interview you, have you on the show. You can apply there. And folks, we love to hear from you. Every email we get is personally read by me. So if you want to message us at podcast at thequattroway.com, that would also be fantastic. Topic requests, just say hello. All of it we're happy to take a look at. And finally, if you want to work with Quattro Capital from an investment perspective, visit us at thequattroway.com slash invest, and we would be happy to have a conversation with you and go from there. And now, without further ado, let's get on to today's feature presentation. All right, all right, all right, Real Estate Runway family, welcome to another episode of the Real Estate Runway podcast. I'm your host, Chad Sutton, your fearless leader, powered by Quattro Capital here behind me. Great to see you all tuning in today, whether it's YouTube, all the places podcasts are shown, and even TikTok. We're on TikTok for your swiping pleasure now, so check it out, Real Estate Runway podcast everywhere you can find them. So today we have a very special guest from the Fun launch black card group that Quattro Capital recently joined. I'm actually wearing my swag. If you're on YouTube right now, this pretty cool Wall Street Rebel polo. I love it. You guys should check it out, funlaunch.com. Anyway, but we have my friend Percy Nicara on the call today, and he's managing partner with Penn Capital. We're going to talk a little bit about who he is as a person, maybe why he joined the black card group as well, and a little bit about what his group is doing. Uh, in, in a little bit of a fashion of staying ahead of the institutional game. So, Percy, welcome to the show today. How's it going, brother? Thanks, Chad. Doing well and looking forward to being on this podcast. Fantastic. Percy, as is tradition, before we get into the meat of the episode today, I got to hear who you are, brother. Tell me about your past, okay. how you got to where you are, where Penn Capital came from, and let, let's do that. Leave no stone sure. unturned. It depends how far back you want me to go, right? So, I grew up on three continents, as you might be able to tell from my confused accents. I've been in the U.S. for over 30 years now. And when I first started, I was in the technology area. I had was fortunate enough to have an exit. And then I was looking at where to put my cap, right? And as most folks do, I had a small portion dedicated to real estate. And then over time, I just like the risk return that I got for real estate and some of the advantages that you got with real estate. So initially I was in single family doing flips, rentals, et cetera. And then as many of our investors that have found, and I'm sure your listeners have found that it's a little hard to scale single family once you get to a certain point. So we started to look for other areas that are still have that tangible asset, which is real estate, but allows us to scale and came across multifamily. And when I started to initially invest in multifamily with some other sponsors, did several LP investments. And then over time, noticed that maybe the underwriting assumptions were not as conservative as they once were. And along the way, some other folks wanted to invest with us. So about almost seven years ago now, we created Penn Capital as a way to enable that. So we're vertically integrated owner operators of multifamily focusing on secondary markets, primarily in the Sun Belt, where we think there's still some opportunity for growth. I love that, Percy. Thanks for that. That's a very concise way to describe a massive amount of experience. So thank you for doing that. But uh, and I, I, you can't just gloss over the fact that you had a tech company that you had, you were fortunate enough to have an exit. That's a massive thing in any entrepreneurial world, especially the technology world. I'm just curious, what was the, if you're able to say on the air, what was the sector? What was the company? How did it go? It was financial services. This is a long time ago in the 99, 2000 time frame, yeah. right before the dot-com bust. If it's a long story, but if it would have gone in 
the way it was supposed to go, I would have been on an island somewhere. But I was, I still did okay. I had an option to retire in my twenties, but that lasted for about less than a week. And then I just couldn't sit on my hands, started to do some other investing. And like I said, started to also dabble into real estate at that time. And now we're full-time into those. I know the sickness. I have it too. Could never sit still if you paid me to. Anyway, you said something else before we get into the meat of the show today. I love having the conversation. As everyone on the show knows, Quattro Capital is also an operator and we choose not to be vertically integrated. And there's not a right answer. It's best for some, best for others, depends on your portfolio strategy. What helped you make the decision to become vertically integrated and what do you love and we'll say dislove about it because yep. they both create their challenges? Sure. When we first started, obviously we were using third-party property managers, right? And I think we've, we went through maybe three property managers and over time as our portfolio was growing, what we were realizing is that while the property managers would be fine and there are a lot of good property managers out there, nobody cares as much about your property as the owner. And what I mean by that is the value of multifamily is based on the net operating income, right? And there's a multiple that you get for every dollar that you add to the net operating income. And that's generally between 20x to 25x, right? Of net operating income or EBITDA based on the cap rate that you use. So it's very important for us to keep a close eye on that net operating income and on the expenses to make sure that our investors are getting the highest returns possible. So just going through a couple of the third party property managers, we noticed they weren't necessarily making every decision through the lens of an owner, if you will. So this allows us to do that. The other thing is there's some operational efficiencies that you get. For example, a chart of accounts could be different based on which property manager you're using versus for us, we have it all structured and well-defined and we use that across our properties. So there's a little more integration of processes. We can roll up data a little better, take a more portfolio centric view and hopefully be able to be more proactive and make proactive decisions versus reactive decisions. That was the main driver. Now. Does it always work that way? Maybe not, right? 100% of the time, but it's certainly a lot better off than it, it was with third-party property managers. Just that's been our experience. The other reason yeah. is we were lucky enough to have somebody on our team who has over 35 years of experience in property management. So she heads our property management division. So when you have a good team and you have the people with more knowledge and experience on your team than in the third-party service provider, that was one decision to just bring it in house. That makes a lot of sense. And just curious, how centralized is your portfolio? Are you in several states? Are you in a couple of states, couple of cities? Yeah, good question. No, we intentionally made the decision to focus on three or four markets because we don't want to be spread too thin. In fact, the majority of our portfolio right now is just in, in one market. We are looking at a couple other markets and we have had our eye on those markets, but it's making sure that the numbers are right for the deal and it makes sense right before we enter that market. But regardless of that, we would not spread, spread ourselves too thin. So we would only focus on three or four markets. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It, it, and that helps a lot when you're building, when you're in the process of vertically integrating to have at least a good right. core location, right? To get those quick economies and seize. Anyway, so I digress back to the episode. So Percy, tell me a little bit about the investment thesis at Penn Capital you know, where you're deploying capital, you know, how you're looking at trying to stay ahead of the institutional money game. Let's walk the thesis road for a little sure. bit, for a little bit. So when we first started several years ago, we were in the hot markets, right? Like Houston, for example. And what we started to notice over time was that the cap rates were being compressed and the asset prices were being inflated. So. We, we were being solicited or people approached us with some pretty good offers. After a while, it got to be very good offers to which we, we took that back to our investors said, Hey, look, while our business plan is to hold the property three to five years, we're getting these offers before in year two and a half, year three. Would you like us to continue to operate the property or would you like us to sell? So when, we, when the offer started to reach our five-year projection prior to year three or year two and a half, we then decided to exit that market. And then at the same time, using a little bit of our tech background, 
we started to aggregate data from some proprietary data sources as well as public data sources and look at are there markets out there that still have good job growth and good population growth, which is the core sort of foundation for good multifamily investment to, but where the cap rates are not as compressed and there's still some meat on the bone, so to speak, or some runway left. So we did identify these markets and we still go through that exercise on a quarterly basis just to make sure we're keeping track of those. And one of the markets that we're in, one of our main markets is Huntsville, Alabama. So we identified that Huntsville market almost four years ago now, and we've been investing in Huntsville for that time. And initially people thought we were a little nuts because not a lot of people were investing in that market. Now it's getting a little more sort of popular. We were able to stay a little bit ahead of the institutional capital. And that's part of our thesis is we like to identify these markets where institutional capital is about to follow. But the idea is to amass a portfolio and then being able to sell that portfolio to an institutional partner. Yeah, and that makes perfect sense. And by the way, we echo that sentiment. We are also invested in that MSA, Huntsville, Athens, Decatur. Great explosion yep. of job growth. Also a lot of products. So you got to watch your yep. subclasses, but there's still a ton of meat on the bone. And gosh, if you got in there, you said seven years ago or five years ago? That, that was about four years ago. Yeah, so even at that point, I lived there back, which you may not know about me, Percy, is I, I before this life, was working for NASA in the rocketry development oh, side okay. in, in Huntsville. When I lived there, I lived in a upper B-class apartment. I still know exactly where it is. It's changed hands four or five times since I was there, but it I was renting a one-bedroom apartment for $435 a month, and it was a great apartment. I loved it. My little salary could handle it. Now, I think that same one bedroom is probably close to a thousand bucks. And that is still what, six, seven, eight hundred dollars below the national average for that amount. So it's like the, not exactly. only is the fundamentals there for the, for, like you said, the population, the job growth, things of that sort, but the rental runway is so far down the affordability chart that it's like, you don't have to worry about affordability being an issue there for a long time to come. Now that, that's a key point. I'm glad you mentioned that. So one of the metrics we also look at is what is the percentage of someone's income going towards rent. And in some of the, let's say, markets that we used to operate in, in some of the sub-markets, it was approaching almost 40%, right? 40% of a person's income or up to 40% was going towards rent, which is not sustainable in our opinion. Versus in Huntsville, given the nature of the jobs and the high-tech jobs and having one of the highest concentrations of PhDs in the country, they're, they make a fairly decent wage the percentage that goes towards rent or housing is in the 20 to 25% range versus the national average be more like 30 to 33%. So that's why we, I, we agree with you. There is still a little more room for growth then. Yeah. And I love that you put that metric on the table. And folks, if you aren't looking at that, I've said this before on the show, you should be because you, look, you can have the best rent growth, best population growth, best, uh, best rental growth shown on paper, say, oh, all the cops show I've got $400 of rental increase here. That's great. But if your rental population in the area is already at 35, 40% rent to income ratio, and you're saying you're going to go raise their rent, get ready for some delinquency problems because that's what comes next. And it's interesting. You, we cross paths again. We also own in Houston, but we have never owned C or D class. We've only ever owned high B, low A class. And so there, the rent to income ratios are about 17, 18% in the Upper West Side. Whereas if you look at Southeast or even over in Humble or places like that, yeah, it's things are being marketed as value add with at least 40% rent to income ratio. It's like, how does that work? So anyway, just I hope you guys are hearing it's a metric to pay attention to and that both of us have latched onto it and won't turn it loose. So anyway, back to the thesis. So you're, you're, you've done something similar to what we've done and created a quarterly proprietary mix of data that helps you predict what markets have some juice to squeeze still and aren't quite out of the affordable range yet either. I'm just curious if you have any sort of color on what may, don't give away your secret sauce, but what major providers are you pulling data in from to, to make that decision? Yeah, they're the usual suspects, right? Like the U.S. Census Bureau, et cetera. But then we actually pay for data from CoStar. ALN is another good source. There's probably about at least seven or eight different data sources that we pull together. And my partner, Ed Rogan, is the one who 
does our underwriting and market research, et cetera. He'd be the expert to talk to, but I know we, on a quarterly basis, review that data and definitely go through it and see what the changes are in terms of even the rent growth, making sure the markets that we're operating in or plan to operate in are still healthy and are still seeing positive rent growth. Yeah, it's like a movie, right? We're all, I think, like you, we're looking at Yardi, CoStar, ALN. I think we even look at some, what's the free one? Citydata.com. Everyone yep. has, there's all sorts of good views out there. When you pull it all together, you start to see harmonization of thought. Oh, you should look over here. That's good to know. So let's pivot back over to your investment thesis a little bit. So Percy, when you guys are looking for an acquisition, what sort of build are you looking for? What sort of value play to execute are you looking for? And what is the way that you say, I'm going to buy this property and go do this to it and make it into something that someone else wants to buy at the institutional level? Sure. So when we first started, we were doing a lot more affordable housing, workforce housing. Those tend to be more C-class properties, sometimes even C- minus that you're bringing up. Now, what we've been focusing primarily on, I'd say, B to A-class properties. We Our vintage has shifted as well. So we would look at anything 2000 and higher, but primarily I'd say most of our portfolio is 2014, 2015 and newer. The one we just, we bought a built to rent community just last month in Athens, that was 2021 build. So that's our, the newest addition to our portfolio. So that was just completed in December of 21, leased up in 22 and it's 98, 99% occupied. So we like build to rent as well. That's the other, I guess we're still lumping it within multifamily, but uh, some people designate it as its own sort of sub asset class, but uh, we, we like build to rent. The other things we're currently looking at, so we have about five or six things in our pipeline. Most of them I think are, yeah, I'd say 2014 and on builds so relatively new for multifamily, less headache, less deferred maintenance. There are some deals that are also new construction. So we sometimes go straight to the builder and say, Hey, don't worry about leasing it up. We'll take that responsibility and we'll lease up the properties. And then lately, given with what's happening in the capital markets and the interest rates, we also look at properties that have assumable debt or assumable loans, right? So these are agency loans that somebody, the, pro the current owner acquired maybe a few years ago, and they got a 3.4, 3.5% debt on it. So we're looking at, is there a way for us to assume that debt? Therefore, in return, give higher returns to our investors. Nectar understands that raising capital is labor and time intensive, and we exist to solve that problem for you. Nectar provides fast, flexible, cash flow based financing for experienced rental owners and operators. Whether you need cash for acquiring properties, portfolios, or you simply need it for ROI generating renovations or expansion of staff, Nectar has your back. Grab your 12 month PNL with debt service and click the link in the show notes below to apply today. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And so you're de risking the portfolio a little bit by going for right. newer assets, higher quality resident bases, and more stable debt products, if I may be so bold, if that exists right yep. now. And, you know, what is the, what, what, when you go inject capital into the building, you're buying pretty new assets. How do you get the NOI growth at that level? Because you're de-risking, which is great, but how do you get that return that people are after? Yeah, good question. So in those newer assets, sometimes there's still some room to put some upgrades, right? So even in this, in the build to rent community that we have, there are some upgrades that you can add. Other times there are amenities that you can add. So we were one of the first to form a partnership with Google in the Huntsville area to provide Google Fiber to, to our communities. And we offer that to our residents at a discount, right? So cheaper than they could go and get directly from Google. And at the same time, we have a revenue share with Google on the back end. So that goes straight to the NOI. And things like washer dryers, we also have a virtual concierge app. So the folks get an app and they can not only schedule, let's say package deliveries, et cetera, but they could also click a button and let's say they're stuck at work. They could click a button and ask somebody to walk the dog. Right. So those types of services, I wish I had at my, my place, but these are the types of amenities that we're introducing. And of course there's a, there's a cost for that, but there's value that our residents are getting, but at the same time, it's also increasing our NOI and therefore again, having that multiplying effect of depending on the cap rate to use, let's say a 
at least a 20 X if you use a five cap to the, to the value of the property. Yeah, it's fantastic. So not only are you de-risking your portfolio and going after newer assets, but you're, you're really catering to that upper level resident who just has probably high need and high expectation because of their busy life. And right. frankly, they're able to pay for convenience. So that, that's, that's right. really, and I guess that's where you have more upper end on the spectrum of what a, an acceptable rent range is in the high B, low A space, right? but you're also not necessarily in most cases, top of market competing yeah. with the luxury. Correct. Right. That's, that's, we like to stay in that B class asset. So it's not at the super high yeah. end and it's not real low either. I think that's just, and it's the most stable, if you will, within the multifamily asset class, which happens to be one of the more stable commercial real estate asset classes. Yeah. And again, it also comes down to knowing the market. That's why we only like to focus on a handful of markets. We know what's worked at some of our other properties. We have insights into the data from the data feeds that we purchase. And then just by interacting with our residents, we know what type of amenities they are looking for and what they're willing to pay and how much they're willing to pay. And we have all that insight knowledge too. That's incredible. And so that, that's a great synopsis on the investment thesis. Tell me about the investment funds. What are you guys doing right now to prepare for what deals might be coming and what does your investment structure look like? Just, let's talk about that a little bit. How are right. you guys putting deals together right now? Sure. So as many folks would have seen, deal flow has slowed a bit because of the capital markets, but I want to say that good deals are still out there, right? You just have to search a little harder, dig a, a little more to find those hidden gems, so to speak. So we still underwrite hundreds of deals. We've always had been pretty conservative on our underwriting, but we stress test our deals even more with exit caps and higher interest rates, et cetera. But then. We also do find good deals, but when we find the deals, the sellers want a quick close. Like for example, this deal we just bought from the builder, we got it at a six cap new construction, which again is like a 20% discount to the market, but we had to move pretty quick and put a pretty big non-refundable sort of money, earnest money deposit down. So in order to do that, that's almost impossible to do in a syndication model, right? So even though we've done nine syndications before, trying to put a legal structure together and fundraise on a deal by deal basis, sometimes you will not be able to capitalize on these opportunities that come up. So having a fund, if we have the dry powder, then we can capitalize in, on these opportunities by moving a lot faster, putting larger deposits, et cetera, because there's some surety of close, which is really what the seller is looking for. Yeah. And folks, that's the answer. I mean, you, you heard him mention. Hey, yeah, we'll buy something that was built two years ago. And a lot of you are probably like, oh, how do you get any return out of that? The answer is how you buy it, folks, right? I would much rather buy 2022, 2023 assets all day long if I could afford to get them at a good basis and still reap some upside in return. It's when you have to buy them at market yielded out pricing that you're top of market and it hurts a little bit. Yeah, fantastic. I'm trying to think if I've missed anything here, but so talk about your, so you have your fund structure. Is that how people who are coming into your deals, that's the way in right now is through the fund structure? How does that set up? Yeah, we need, so through the fund, we can provide some diversification across different assets in a particular market, as well as across certain markets. This is a closed end fund, which means we'll have about three or four, or plan is to have three to four assets within that fund. And it's a five-year term for that fund. Now, some people understand the value. They like to come into the fund. Others still prefer the, on a deal by deal approach. So realistically, we have both vehicles available. There are some slightly different waterfalls as well as there's a different sort of minimum to get into the direct deal fund or SPV. But otherwise we, yeah, we, our goal is to bring everybody in through the fund. Again, going back to that, having that dry powder available, because we think overall it's going to be good when we can buy the deals at a much lower basis, right? That's better for the investors and better for everybody. So Percy, one question on the fund structure that I get from our investors a lot and people looking at funds is, and this is, you get a different flavor of this question from institutional players and LP at players, because I think it, it's good for institutional players and it freaks LP players out. So I love to ask this question to those who seem to understand the fund model so that we can try to help people understand the different variations on this. You're doing a closed-ended fund. 
Do you have any concept of rebalance built into the fund or is it everyone comes in at par, nothing changes? And I guess asked another way for those who are listening who've probably never heard the term rebalance before. Think about it this way. If you're the first dollar in the fund, let's say it's a $100 million fund and that fund is going to buy seven assets. If you're the first guy in there, you come in at one price, but if you're the last guy in there and there's already seven operating assets and your risk is lower, you come at a different price per share, if that makes sense. Some funds address this, some don't. There's no right answer. I'm just curious how Penn Capital chooses to do it. Yeah, that's actually a good question. And uh, a few discussions with our SAC attorneys around that, as well as our fund admin. So we have a third party fund admin as well. So what they recommend it is to keep it simple for the, at least for the initial funds. So we have a preferred return. So the structure or the waterfall structure in the fund is an 8% preferred and then an 80-20 split. We actually give 80% of the profits to our investors versus if they come into the deal, it's an 8% or then a 70-30 split. So we sort of try to incentivize them to come into the fund and the folks, and it's a rolling close. Now there's only a finite amount of time that we're going to be doing the fundraising. So it's not like an open-ended fund where you'll be maybe rebalancing or calculating the NAV over the life of the fund. In our case, it's a one year, we have one year to raise the capital pretty much. And there are some extensions available to us that we need to, but we're planning to pretty much raise the capital and start acquiring the assets. So we already have the first asset. We're looking at, we're in the middle of looking at some assets and then invest in final on a few of them. So hopefully, We'll have a second asset into the fund soon. So we're looking at three or four assets in the fund where it's only going to be like a 12 month raise period. And within that time frame, if you come in, your pref calculation or accruing starts as soon as you make the investment. So if you come in today, you get a, a pref. There's some added incentives as well. We've lowered the minimum investment for some of the folks who came in early. So there are a couple of things you can do to incentivize people coming in upfront. If you come in with a large enough check, you may lower the management fee, things of that nature, right? But we're not rebalancing the portfolio within that one year period because that's a short enough time frame where we think it'll, we'll just be able to start acquiring these assets. Yeah, folks. And that is yet another way to do it where it's okay. The fund is only, it's only a one year raise period, ideally, assuming it all gets raised. And therefore you're not really going to feel much difference in risk as if it was a three year fund. And you go from one to seven assets over three years. So that, that's a, this was, and so this answer folks is the, this is the easiest one to wrap your head around. It doesn't happen. Rebalance can get very complicated and it can make, you can feel like you're paying a penalty in some cases. So I respect the way y'all took that. I just love hearing everyone's take on it. But Percy, thank you for that. Now, before we let you go, we got to get through some quattro questions here and sure. get to know you a little bit more. How's that sound? Sounds good. All right. Question number one. What is your superpower and how does it help you? I'm not sure if it's my superpower, but I was lucky enough to be part of a pretty talented team, right? Or be able to bring together a team. So I mentioned our Della, who's a person who heads our property management, has over 35 years of experience. My partner, Ed, he, he's really good with identifying these deals, especially off-market deals. I'd say majority of our deals, actually almost all, except for maybe one, are, have been off market deals. So he's good at sniffing those out and underwriting those. Our CFO has a good background in real estate based finance for large companies like GE. So we've been fortunate enough to bring a team together and hopefully we'll continue to expand and grow the team. Right. So if I have some small role to play by bringing those folks together, I'd say that's my superpower. I would say building excellent teams is absolutely a superpower and essential to running a business. Our right, question number two, let's see the flip side of the coin. Give me your biggest mistake. What's the biggest one you've made? Could be life or business. And what did you learn from it? I'd say it's maybe not launching a fund soon enough and, and having this dry powder available maybe a little bit earlier, right? Uh, to be able to scale. There are some pretty public examples of some syndicators who have then moved to the fund model and more to institutional investors that they've had great success and I wish them all the best. I think maybe we could have scaled a little bit faster as well prior to the deal flow taking a bit of a dip as we see in the market right now. Yeah. Don't be too discouraged on that because right after the dip is always the buying frenzy. So I think yeah, it's the bottom by true. a little bit, <laughs> you're going to be well capitalized for it. That's our goal, right? With the fund is to have that dry powder and we do see some 
we are already starting to see some opportunities, honestly, but we think there'll be a few more coming in the next, let's say, 12 months. Very good. I love it. Question number three, Quattro is based on four pillars, people, property, profit, and then philanthropy, coming back around and taking care of people. I love to give my guests a chance to talk about their philanthropic heart on the air. And we've actually had a lot of instances of people donating on their behalf. So what would that be for you? So at Penn Capital, we, we also believe in philanthropy and would like to actually form our own foundation. That's one of our goals. I don't know if it'll happen this year, but certainly for, for next year, but we definitely want to create a foundation. But in the meantime, we actually donate a fair amount to multiple foundations, nonprofit foundations. One of them is called Hope Serve Action, and that's was actually founded by a group who are investors in some of our properties, and they created, it's a group of doctors and dentists, and they created this foundation, so we support that. We support World Central Kitchen or UNSF. There's a number of nonprofits that we support, and on a personal side, my wife and I, we don't have kids, so we're planning to leave pretty much what we have to, to charity, so we're setting up a personal foundation as well. Yeah, it's incredible. I love that so much. You just <laughs> giving back to the world is it's the only way to to really make that legacy. I love it. Last question. You guys have a free gift that I'd love to let you promote here on the air and maybe tell the listeners what it is, where to find it, and uh, what it's all about. Sure. So we have a, a guide that we give out to some of the folks who are new to commercial real estate or multifamily. And it just goes through all the different asset classes, the pros and cons, maybe a few terms that you may not be as familiar with, et cetera. And we're happy to share that uh, with your listeners. If they send me an email at percy at pencapitalgroup.com. I don't know if you want to put that in the show notes or make that a link available to them. We're happy to send that up to them. Yep. And folks, that will be in the show notes wherever you're watching or listening to this. Just scroll right on down and that's there for your clicking pleasure. All right, Percy, thank you for coming on the show, sharing your knowledge, your investment thesis. But the last question that I have to ask you before we conclude the show is if people want to reach out to you, I think you just gave one option, but what's the best way to reach out to work with Penn Capital, get to know you a little bit better, research you, where's all that at? They can either come to our website, which is Penn Capital Group, that's P-E-N-C-A-P-I-T-A-L-G-R-O-U-P.com, a little bit of a long URL, but that's the one that was available. Or send me an email, that's Percy, P-E-R-C-Y, at pencapitalgroup.com. Again, folks, right down in the show notes for your clicking pleasure. Percy, you're the man. Thanks for coming on. Talk to you next time. Thanks, Chuck. Do you manage multiple legal entities? Is your data scattered across various unsecure systems? Is your team spending too much time on manual processes? Do you struggle to meet reporting deadlines? Simplify entity management and compliance with Entity Keeper. Entity Keeper helps easily manage entities, build and maintain complex organizational charts, and track filing deadlines all in one secure, cloud-based platform. And with automated alerts and centralized document storage, you'll stay two steps ahead of compliance deadlines. Click the link in the show notes to learn more and book a demo. All right, folks, that was a fantastic episode with my friend Percy from Penn Capital. I hope you enjoyed the conversation, got some learning out of it, listened to how much of a fantastic operator this group is, and just hopefully learned some nuggets of what metrics to look at and what makes a good, low-risk, high-return asymmetric return investment. Okay. So if you got any value out of the show, please leave us that five-star review, thoughtful comment, like us, subscribe on YouTube, wherever you're at. Those are the only way we pay it forward and get to more people like you. So pay it forward, friend, pass it on. Until next time, this has been an episode of the Real Estate Runway podcast over and out. We hope this episode was insightful and brought value to your day. If so, please be awesome and leave us a five-star review. Find out how Team Quattro can help you at thequattroway.com. Until next time, this is the Real Estate Runway Podcast.